says, how many children are expelled for every 1,000 children in early education? The good news is you guys thought it was way worse than earlier. No good. But it is really bad, but the closest answer was the person who wrote nine. Me. Oh. So her prize is this book called How You Filled Your Bucket Today, which you are all That's okay. <laughs> but it's a really great book if you haven't ever used it with kids. I chose it today because I'm trying to pick some practical gifts for you that tie into what we're doing with the pyramid, and that one for sure kind of summarizes everything that the pyramid is about. Um, the actual answer is 10. So, but that's still really high. And um, some of the information that they found, I think in the book, it's that it's getting down to three or four when they implement best practices. So, um, and, and, and a new trivia question. Yeah, I have a new trivia question. We're going to take a break or whatever you can go answer. It. Um, that deals with our session two, which is inclusion. So um, I'll just introduce myself again. My name's Brooke. Um, and I've been teaching at this school for eight years, and this school is and was one of the first preschools in the state to practice inclusion. So balswan has been a preschool for 52 years now, and um, right at the get-go realized right away how beneficial it was for kids to be with their typically developing peers and how both of them made gains that wouldn't have been made otherwise. So this session that we're going to get into is really um, totally focused on inclusion. It's a topic that we could spend weeks on, um, but we're just going to kind of, just like Vanessa did, these two sessions today are really a lot of information at you uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the pyramid. But it's really a foundation that's important so that you know, just like with the research that's going into the pyramid, this too is evidence-based, this too is best practices, and it's also the law. So we're going to get into a little, I'm going to play lawyer for a little bit, and we're going to, and teacher, and we're going to get into the reasons of why inclusion is a uh, best practice. So again, as always, we thank um, the folks who have contributed to the Pyramid Plus as our funders. You'll see there are a lot of funders in here who do specialize in um, working with children with disabilities. So our agenda today, and just so you know, I'll keep trying to do this in the future, I kind of um, made a visual schedule for you guys because in the pyramid, everybody likes to know what's coming and how much more we have till we're at the end. So we'll go over the agenda today, but if you ever feel like you want to keep track, it's right there on the blue. And I also have a card for taking a break, which I thought, I kind of have a place in my mind, but since we haven't run this presentation before. I'm not sure when the natural breaks can occur. So if one of you wants to volunteer, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. When you feel like this presentation is a longer than the one that we had, or when you feel like you need to take a break, I'm going to let whoever wants to be the take a break in person. Does anyone want to say? Okay. Well, tell me when you want to break. <laughs> if you need a break, just raise your hand. Um, I need that card at home. You can show it to your husband. So first we're going to go over, of course, what we're going to learn about inclusion today. We'll go over some of the logistics again, just to refresh. We've got a lot more activities where you'll be collaborating with your peers at your table. We'll do some um, work where there's a little more interaction than there was in the last, um, the last, uh, session. So we have an activity, another short 10 minute video, another activity about inclusion. Then like I said, that legal piece, we're going to get into what the law says about inclusion and working with children with special needs. Um, we're going to dive a little into the research and spend some, I, some time doing some activities where you get to um, do some thinking and some observations based on your experiences. And I think this is a fantastic group. I'm super excited that you're all here. I think we have so much to learn from each other. You've got the elementary school piece to bring in. So many home providers bring a totally new dimension to some of the challenges and um, aspects that go into inclusion. And then um, Molly and um, Amber bring so much knowledge when it comes to inclusion because they, they've got a family history that just allows them to bring not only a, as an educator, but just as, 
as family members who have worked with um, the special needs um, strategies, I guess. So we'll also dive a little bit into the leadership team, especially because some of you have aspirations for using that skill in your um, in your workplace. And then we'll finish up with what are some strategies we can do. Like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to inclusion. And we'll wrap up with our thought seeds and, and the quality improvement plan at the end. So like I said, this is um, all research that's been evidence-based. It's going to be presented to you so that you understand the value and importance of practicing inclusion. And if this isn't something that you're already, do already doing, then it can be something that changes your mindset so that it is something you start doing. And if it is already something you're doing, it's um, empowering you all to become advocates for all children. And I, I think that's the most important thing. Um, I liked what that person said in the last video that Vanessa was talking about, where he said, he saw my child for the individual person that they were. And I think that really speaks to what we're going to talk about in this session, is not really viewing kids as this is this group and here's a kid with special needs, but all kids and how are they individuals, because every child is, is unique. Um, we're going to look at some of the challenges for families and programs and professionals who are um, working with children, and then learn about some of the solutions that have worked, um, that we know work based off of the evidence and what we can do um, to solve those challenges. So we already have gone through and made a list of the ground rules for the first session. Is there anything now that we've got one session under our belt that you feel like you'd like to add to it? No? Okay. If there is, just let us know. Um, same thing for the parking lot. I think you guys have already started with a great list. Um, those are... Um, some important things that I think will be useful information to get back to you. And if so, this is a session where a lot of things can come up that you might want more information about. So just feel free to make sure that we add it on there. Um, we're going to go through the handouts. The first one is the acronyms handout. If you, oh. surround 
um, working with people with um, special needs. There's two of those. 2.7 is labeled people first language. This is an awesome article. If you don't feel like you already talk about people using this kind of language, I highly encourage you to read it. We'll reference it, but it's a short article, but really powerful, I think. Uh, 2.8 is a longer um, handout, and we will use it when we do an activity, um, but it goes into more details about some of the types of challenges and strategies that we can use to overcome them. 2.9 is our two-part activity that we'll do together. And 2.10 is, this is the home version of a checklist. We'll get into this a little bit more at the end, but for those who would like more information about um, diving into inclusion and making sure that you're doing it at, and at a best practice level, there's checklists like this that are offered so that you can um, begin to um, monitor your progress with data and the um, And 2.11 is just some more resources should you have more information and would like to find it. It's mostly websites that you can go to. And our last one's 2.12, which we'll use at the end for your process. Um, let's see. Um, the last thing is just to reiterate, um, if you need to use the restrooms, I'm fine just getting up and going. Um, I want to try to honor your time and make sure we're done at 10 and um, since it's a late night. But the restrooms, there's one at this end and there's another one down the hall after you turn right. Um, feel free to take a break whenever you need it. And when we do our group break, we can, um, we'll have one in the middle. Um, and help yourself to any more snacks or drinks if you need to get some out of the kitchen. So the real intent behind this um, slide is just to let you know that the pyramid, when it modified itself to pyramid plus, what it did was it took all the best from special quest, building blocks, leap, and PTR, and it just folded it into those levels. And Vanessa kind of already went through how that folded in. But what you need to know is that there's no child that cannot benefit from the pyramid practices. Every child fits in this framework, and every child can find success. So the first thing we're going to do is an activity um, about some of the challenges that we face and some of the benefits that we see when families or uh, teachers, home care providers, um, communities, what do they see when they're working in with inclusion? So, um, Wardra's going to kind of make a list and make some observations, but this is a time for you guys to share your collective experience. So let's start with the challenges. What are some of the challenges that you've either experienced or seen or read about um, with regards to inclusion? Language barrier. Language. Like I, um, my niece is deaf, so her her mother luckily was a teacher, so she was able to advocate for her. And I see we see that a lot with children here at Bell Swan. A lot of speech delays, a lot of nonverbal kids. Um, language can be a tough one because if you don't know sign language or you don't know. Um, Yes, the frustration level is extremely heightened because they don't have a way to communicate. And the really awesome thing is when we get into later sessions, I feel totally confident as a teacher that there is no kid that I couldn't easily handle off the bat, except for maybe a blind child. I'd have to spend a little more time thinking about that. We've never had a, whoop, I said around, a child who is blind. Um, but other than that, um, we feel really comfortable here, so I hope that you feel that way too. Um, what other challenges can you think of? I think as a home daycare provider, my challenge <coughs> is parents' involvement. Okay. Because when I go through a training, even just the little pyramid that I did here, 
it was almost overwhelming for them. They kind of put me like I'm up here and they're down here, and I couldn't get that across to them that you can do exactly what I'm doing, and it's really just, you know, it, old school, it was power of positive motivation, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And so I'm trying to kind of get to their level and then get them involved. Yes. But they, I, don't, I need to figure out how to do that constructively. And I think parent involvement can even vary by family. I mean, I have to say in my experience, some of the parents who have come to me with children with special needs have been the most lovely people to work with because they know that child inside and out. They've spent so much time already figuring things out and they really want to share what what has worked, what hasn't, and help us to be successful and kind of partner together. So hopefully we get to be able to tweak it. It is challenging though when somebody brings their child to you, assuming they're a typically developing child, and you're finding some red flags going off, and you're needing to reference them to an agency to get some more support, and the parents don't want to hear that. That's, 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 that's really hard right yeah. there. You're right. Um, I was going to say for, especially for group care, is the challenges would be, of inclusion would be, um, like you said before, the ratios. You have 20 preschoolers and two teachers. If it's more of a, that one child needs a lot more one-on-one -on -one attention. Yeah. So then you're more like one teacher with one child and one teacher with 18. And it's it's finding that balance right. of meeting the needs of all all of the children in group care and yet meeting the needs of the inclusion and right. stuff like that. But that's a big challenge in group care is meeting all of the needs of all of the children and, and keeping I think them that's all safe. And I think them even all classroom learning. teachers would agree that yeah. sometimes it feels like one and then yeah. the other person exactly. left yeah. to deal with the rest of the class yeah. and hope nobody else has right. yes. Um One that I know is just following through at home and in school. The consistency. The same. Yes. <laughs> Did you have something else? Yeah, I would say um, kind of the age development appropriateness as far as how to handle things within the classroom because mm -hmm. a child may be one age but developmentally another one and so creating that balance in there and the resources to provide for that. And and I I agree that's something difficult. We've even experienced it in our classroom where we're set up with a certain range of materials and then you have a child who's not anywhere near that range and so you're needing to make modifications and adoptions and find out where they are but also swing it so that everybody's doing it together and no and nobody's being left out. It, it is a challenge. I know recently we were trying to find child care for a kid in our class. We needed some home child care and um, the teacher who was in charge of it different ones 
and um, but the behavior is not a real issue with me. It's the parent. I got to figure out how to put them in with me. Yeah. So I, I see a lot of parent fear mm -hmm. often, and so yes. therefore that comes into resistance is that they don't. Um, because I think as educators, we we have uh, dealt with kids with lots of different um, struggles and issues, and so I think we're very well versed in that. We come from this loving place, but I think a lot of parents grew up in an environment where um, children with special needs were treated very differently than how they are now. And so there's a lot of fear and resistance for their child being labeled. And um, and I think that that comes into play and we're trying to re-educate the parents and also um, to help their child at the same time. And so I think that's a, I see that as a challenge um, on all fronts. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to kind of tap onto that as well, um, kind of seeing just with my experience and my son going from, you know, Bell Swan and going to the public school system. A lot of those fears have come into play now and, you know, a little bit of understanding because many doors have been shut because of his, you know, what he's been labeled as or what his, his um, disability may be, you know, as far as we don't have the choice to go into any school that we want based on what we think would be best for his needs because the services aren't there. They close the doors as well because they say, well, we don't have the resources for that. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at it from a different perspective as well, just thinking, well, you know, because my child has um, a diagnosis, the, all those fears initially, you know, when you're just like, gosh, you know, what does this mean? You know, what is, what's going to happen for him in the future? Some of that's starting to play out now because it is challenging getting into certain schools or doing certain things. And even in our last school, it almost became where um, the fact that he had a behavioral plan, it was detriment to us progressing um, because of the fact that any time that anything happened for him, they've got to check and they're tracking him. When there's another child that's right next to him who's doing, who's initiating a lot of the behavior, but he's not on a behavioral plan because he doesn't have a diagnosis. So because I was proactive in being that parent that's there every day, trying to, okay, let's get this in place, let's get this going, it's it's become a negative to him, which is unfortunate. So it just, it kind of goes full circle to see where it starts off, if there are some fears, and it does become a little challenging. This is why, and I'm kind of starting to see that unfold now. So oh, it's, it's so upsetting. Oh, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. But, yeah. So, well, and the, the good news is I think you have experienced something good where it's working right, and I think that's why we're doing these kinds of trainings. Right. Is when, the more we can promote the message, the more we can be advocates for Absolutely. our own kids as well Absolutely. as other kids, we can change this perception and this fear so that um, every child has the same opportunity. Um, let's talk about some of the benefits and sort of kind of swing in that way a little bit. What are some of the benefits from inclusion that you've either experienced? How many of you have actually how many of you have children with special needs in your programs or have had them? Oh, awesome. Okay. You were in a, in a different environment. Were you in a more of a older children? Yes, I was getting to uh, children from grade six to nine. Oh. Uh, nevertheless, I have been curious to know about this and this topic has always interested me. And one such quotation that really touched me, which I read about which is from the perspective of children with disabilities is, uh, we are also flowers like other children with petals. Just because one petal is missing, why is it that we are treated like crumpled and crushed flowers? Mm -hmm. So this was something that really ignited the minds. And um, I felt the inclusion, talking about the benefit, it broadens the mindset of the people. Uh, even though the parent of the child might be more involved, when she talks about it to her neighbors, uh, colleagues at her workplace, you know, it kind of broadens the uh, mindset of the people, so the blockage is removed. Mm -hmm. And uh, people try to uh, invite that kind of acceptance, uh, uh, which is more out of um, responsibility than just sympathizing. Absolutely. So about how they can help the situation, how they can cope. Uh, so if they become aware, at least as a neighbor, you know, you can try to help the parent who has a child with disability instead of mocking at her, instead of comparing, instead of, uh, you know, that but way empathy. it sensitizes mm -hmm. the individuals. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. 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 
That's beautifully said. I think that empathy piece is something that's kind of run <coughs> true in all of the work that we do um, with the pyramid, but I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and we'll get into it a little later. I won't go into this, but I totally agree. And, I, and when you think about it from a family perspective, they're with a child, and whether or not their special need is something that's a strain or difficult to deal with, it's something that they're submerged in 24 7. So like you said, that mindset of coming at it from a positive place of being supportive and helpful versus, um, as you said, mocking or, or making it difficult is truly um, life-changing for a family. Well, the empathy with the other children. Absolutely. Children, I mean, yes. adults, one thing, but you know, that the empathy with the kids. There's a little boy with Down syndrome at my daughter's school, and one day I was there for lunch, recess, or whatever. And I saw all the big kids playing football with him, and they're like, oh, hate it, you know, and it's like, that's just wonderful to see that this is part of their life, it's a normal thing, and right. there is it's no big deal. Yeah. It's their fun. It's really fun. One of the people that was in the video was Kelly Jo Wilson, and her son um, has special needs and has gone through the system, and she's been a fantastic parent, but it's been hard. And he's in high school, and they just had him on the news. I don't know if maybe you saw it, but he was on the local news because he got elected um, homecoming king. And it was it was truly the same thing. Like they just loved him as a person because he was just an awesome kid. And those kinds of stories are really touching, and it, it would be nice to be more widespread. Okay. I um, worked with um, kids with high functioning autism, and some of they were some of my favorite students. And one of the reasons I actually chose Val Swan specifically was because I wanted my son to be with students with um, special needs. And one of the, a couple of reasons is one is I wanted him to see them as people and as, with, as with, and see their strengths. Right. And not just see the challenges. I feel like sometimes we focus so much on the challenges that we forget um, you know, how funny they can be or you know, how smart they can be in certain areas. And I think that's really important that um, that diversity, I think that that's huge um, for everyone. And for them to see their own strengths as well. I think that's really important. By the way, her son did master this. I went right near a circle, I had to peel him off. I love you, my buddy. He's just <laughs> loving out. I'm like, okay, back up a little bit. And they do. It's true, I mean, he loves him. It's funny. And that was his friend. And that, that, I mean, that is so cool that he did not make any distinction there. Um, and that's so awesome. And I think just, I've always told my girls the same thing <coughs> in the pyramid is that's what it's all about. If we were all the same, it'd be super boring. Yeah. Yeah. Super boring. Yeah. Right. I really don't want to meet more people that are exactly the same as me. I think it's interesting to meet other people. And I think the more we get into the inclusion piece, we'll just talk a little bit more about that kind of mindset shift, that viewpoint where you're just seeing people as people and they all have strengths. They all have things that are hard for them. When my daughter was at Bell Swan here, she used to have two little twins in her class that had um, cystic fibrosis, and they used um, those um, those walker helper yeah things. I don't know what they're called. Um, but she came home and asked me about it one day because she was she didn't understand why they were different. And I said, well, you know, you were really lucky, and learning how to walk was so easy for you. That was just something that was easy, but for them. This is hard, and they're working so hard, and they're being so brave. And isn't that so cool to have a friend that's so strong like that? And it's just that mindset. She was like, "Oh yeah, like good job, dude. They're working really hard, rather than seeing it as a stigma or something yeah. weird or something to avoid or stay away from." So, just to stay on track, I think you guys have awesome ideas, and I'm looking forward to going through more of them. But we'll keep going because we actually have a lot of activities. So we have a quick video. Um, if you want to open your handout to page, the 2.2 handout, um, you can look it over, but this is a video we're going to see that was created by um, Hilton Early Head Start. So it's a program that works with infants and toddlers. And this group is kind of sharing their vision on inclusion and what their hopes and dreams are for these kids. It's a touching 10 minute little video. Um, it actually won quite a few awards in it created on behalf of Special Quest, which was one of the collaborative partners in the Pyramid Quest Foundation. 
Um, so if you look at handout 2.2, it has a couple of questions on it. Uh, that say, what is the vision that was illustrated and what do the family and service providers say about their experience? So after we watch the video, I'll give you a few minutes to kind of write your thoughts down and then we'll discuss the video in a little bit uh, as a group. Do you guys have any questions before she hits play?